ano ay nga ranga tira te nei te mihia tu kia kauta nau mai fakatai mai he hono rei kro rei ki te atu he mau ngoro ki te kino ai fakaro pai ki nga tanga takato i te nei wa he fakaro hoki ki rato ko fituranga te ara te ra o nga ranga tira i hinga mai i runga i te fira futi pora ki muri hiku hari atura hari atura hari atura me te rā hoki ngā rangatira o tēnā o tēnā marae huri no te mutu o te wiki o te marama o te tau i hinga mai i haere, haere a moe atura. A tātou te kanu ora i hui hui mai nei i raru i te maru o tēnei a tātou kōrero rangatira a tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Nau mai whakatau mai, nau mai whakatau mai, mauri o mai o kete kōrero o whakaaro i rungi i te ātamira he whiri whiri me pēhia, e pāna ki tēnei o ngā kōru i te rā nei. E rua ngā taha o tēnei kōru, he taha pāga, he taha Māori. Me ngā huarahi, kia taia e tātou te kimi, te rapu, te oronga, mo te iwi whānui o Aotearoa. Nō reira, a tēnei te mihatu kia koutou, ko tai maha koutou i tēnei wā te whakarongo, ki ngā kai kōro, ki ngā rangatira, hei whakapāho atu tēnei a tātou kōro i te atanei, ki a koutou katoa i haramai mai tawhiti, i haramai mai tata, te whakarongo i ngā kōro. Kā reo i kume ake tēnei kōro, kā tū tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou i tēnei wā, te tuku tēnei wāhanga, ki ngā kai kōro, ki ngā kai rangatira, nā rātou tēnei kōro, i runga i ngā piki me ngā heko e te wā, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, a kia ora tātou katoa. Ite me ano na ne te aroha no na tuku na ituku iho ituku iho. Apit iho no ta ta iho no te hunga wairo ki te hunga wairo hari atura hari atura. E taku hoa, e taku whananga, a tiraha mai koe. Haere atu rā, haere atu rā, a tātou te kanu e orau i hui hui mai nei, i raru i te maru o tēnei a tātou kōro, o tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ki ora tātou katoa. Good morning and welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Before I hand the rako over to Fasanta, I just want to um, start off a uh, mihi to our kaiwaiata and to everyone here and to our whānau that are here today. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, warm greetings to you all. It's lovely to see such a group, great group of people here uh, this morning. My name is Vasanta Krishnan and I'm the director of the Knowledge Group in Superu. For those of you that aren't familiar with Superu, Superu is a social policy evaluation and research unit. Superu has been set up to increase the use of knowledge across the social sector to improve decision making that improves the impacts on the lives of New Zealanders, their family, their whānau and communities. One of our key roles is to measure and monitor well-being of families and we do this through the annual Families and Whānau status report. The 2015 report contains a wealth of information about the well-being of families and whānau which has implications for policy and practice across a wide range of areas. Our two speakers today are Beverly Hong and Andrew Spall, and it's very good to see Andrew here. <laughs> it was delayed by a slight plane hiccup this morning. Beverly Hong is a principal advisor families and Fano in Superu and has a wealth of experience in research and evaluation across the social sector, including social development, labour, immigration, education, culture and heritage. Andrew Spool Natiapa Rangatane Terarawa has a background in sociology and epidemiology and is a senior research fellow at the University of Auckland teaching in um, survey methodologies and official statistics. I'll now hand over to Beverly and Andrew to tell you more about the findings of the 2015 Families and Whanau Status Report. 
Tēnā koutou katoa and um, morena and welcome everyone to this presentation. Really pleased to be at the point of having released the report and being able to share the information with you. Um, so I'm going to speak a bit about the approach and the background to the work and an overview of the uh, family wellbeing analysis and results and Andrew is going to talk uh, about the whānau uh, wellbeing analysis. This has very, very much been a collaborative uh, research project with many different players and research experts contributing to the work. In particular, as I mentioned, uh, Te Puna Kokere and Superu uh, co-commissioned the uh, whānau analysis and chapter that was, um, that was completed by Andrew Spall from Uni Auckland University and Atahu Kukatai and Matt Rutskridge from Nidia. As well, we had strong support and assistance from Statistics New Zealand in the family wellbeing analysis, both in exploring how best to use the data to create family measures and how to present that information in the best way possible. Uh, we had expert contributors in the report from um, Len Cook, Jan Pryor and L. John Fitzgerald. Uh, there's also uh, qualitative voices within the report and that was a commissioned piece of work um, undertaken by Research New Zealand for Superu, and that uh, was um, 27 dyad interviews of a range of different family types and ethnicities to sort of add some depth and detail to the, to the, to the statistics and numbers. Uh, and we've also um, developed this work through the follow-on from the 2014 report in terms of uh, consultation feedback that was provided by those who engaged in this work and also we ran a workshop to help us identify how to shift to the practical aspect of um, developing indicators. So just to give you some background because I, it actually does form the platform for where we've got to today and guided a lot of the decisions in the science and you know the more the subjective art aspect of um, creating indicators around family well-being. Superu's got a statutory requirement to produce an annual report that measures and monitors family well-being. Um, and there have been three rep reports completed to date. And the 2013 and 2014 report basically set the approach, the platform and the conceptual thinking that meant that in the current year we have actually um, pulled together indicators around the frameworks that were developed. So the 2013 report um, began really by looking at demographic data over time, thinking about the complexity and the diversity of families, and looking at um, looking at things such as the changing population, changing in terms of smaller family sizes an ageing population with increased longevity, the increase in one-person households and higher rates of families forming and dissolving. It looked at the, the difficulties in measuring family wellbeing, the difficulties around creating uh, measures which treated the family as the unit of analysis rather than an individual. So you're wanting to create, ideally, a measure which takes into account the different perspectives and roles of the different members of the family. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, not, there's hardly any of that sort of information to use to create that kind of indicator, let alone the methodology um, that's been tested and that people agree upon in which to actually use the data to create your indicators. Um, the other element, I think, in the background work that was done has been a very strong commitment to a two-strand bicultural approach to this work and that's in relation to uh, the families analysis that's been undertaken and the final analysis that's been undertaken. And from the get-go, there's been the development of frameworks situated more in a traditional Western approach and situated in a kapapa Māori, te ao Māori approach. And Andrew's going to talk a bit more about the frameworks and the development of that work. Uh, last year there was um, an examination of literature around wellbeing and part of that embraces the idea as has been sort of recognised in more recent years of the need to go beyond just the economic and GDP and actually start to think more holistically about building a picture about how people and families are faring. And the importance of family, that relates to, I suppose, a core essential aspect of individual belonging, if you like, that is that first port of call in terms of 
uh, being brought up as children and then later on provides the, the support as we get older. And I mean there are many different definitions of family and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, in this research I think the, um, the data has been in some ways from the project management perspective, which was my, my role in, this, um, in, in creating this report, in some ways the limitations has meant that it's been very easy to make some decisions because they've been made for me as to what we can analyse and what we can present. On the other hand, what it's done is it's actually uh, limits the, the interpretation and what we can say until we've gathered more data over time to understand it better. So in the 2015 report, we refined and consolidated uh, the conceptual frameworks that we developed. Uh, we presented a set of family wellbeing um, indicators guided by the family wellbeing framework and as I mentioned before, the whānau analysis was undertaken guided by the whānau rangatiratanga framework. I guess the key things that we looked, I, that, that sort of guided how we did this work was its purpose, which was that we wanted to be practical, policy relevant, readily understood by the audience and evidence that could be useful and used to help um, make decisions. Um, so on the plus side, as I said, many of the decisions that we had to make actually ended up being made for us in terms of turning the theory into the practical because of the data limitations that there were. And one of those things was that in the data that I present, because the majority of data sources are sample based, we actually were not able to break it down further by ethnicity or region, which are you know, always desirable things to do. Um, the other thing that we were unable to do is look at multiple disadvantage across families. So looking now just at the frameworks at a high level, these were developed in first the conceptual platform in 2013, then the initial frameworks were developed through consultation workshops in 2014, and then this was and these were refined um, at the beginning of this year through workshops, which actually we took it to the point of thinking, okay, now if we were going to use this to decide on indicators, so that people could look at and consider how family and whānau are faring, what are the practical aspects of this framework which which we need to keep in mind? I'm going to leave um, Andrew to talk more about the Whānau Rangatiratanga conceptual framework um, and there was also a matrix that was built off this to guide the, the indicators that were eventually chosen and I'm going to talk more about the um, family wellbeing framework. I'm just going to get myself a bit more organised. Okay. So firstly, um, as I was talking before, Looking at family well-being, we chose to focus on taking, I guess, the simplest building block, keeping in mind that this is the first step in mapping indicators, and we wanted to take the, the simplest building block so that we can build on that over time. In doing so, what we decided to do was to shift away from the idea of mixing up the idea of families and households together. So for the family analysis, at least, we didn't have what had previously been reported, which is multi-family households. We actually took each of those families and allocated them to the family type which they were of, and then treated whether there are other families in the household as a variable. So we identified six types of family types, couples both under 50, uh, couples one or both um, under, well it should be over 50, so that should be couple one or both over 50, two parents at least one child under 18 years, one parent at least one child under 18 years, two parents all children 18 years and over, and one parent all children 18 years and over. Now the, the selection of the family types and using an age-based thing was related to the idea of um, reflecting life stages and life courses. So before um, having family, during having a family with school-aged children, post, um, you know, older once the children have left home. Now keeping in mind that there's a whole range of variation that can happen through the life stages and life courses and people's journeys through different families, you know, styles across households within households is very, very different. The, because of the data, our definition is for those, it relates to those family types living within the same household, okay, and where there are 
and the children are within the same household as well. So even though we've got a couple, say, both under 50 years in the same household, they may have had a child or children in another household, our focus is on that definition within that, under that roof. Um, and that's because of data limitations at this stage. The whānau types used the same six uh, family type basis and then added multi whānau household as a different approach to the analysis linked with their framework. Okay, so how were families doing? So overall, um, many families and whānau were enjoying good levels of wellbeing, though for each indicator, a portion were not doing so well. I mean, one of the things that we did in terms of, which you'll see a bit later, is all of our indicators are positioned to look, um, I suppose, at the proportion who were doing well. So that's how we've reported our indicators, and that's partly because then we can depict it holistically as a group, which you'll see shortly. The other element of that is because of the sample sizes and things like uh, the sample size issue, um, we're better to be reporting the bigger number because of confidence um, in being able to estimate those well, then if we focused on the smaller number, you know, right, right at the tail end, then, then actually that is actually becomes very, very challenging in terms of being able to get estimates that you can talk about in a, in a reliable way. We did find that single parent families with younger children, single parent whānau and whānau living in multi whānau households rated poorly on a range of wellbeing indicators and those were particularly in the economic, security, the housing, mental health, education and employment spaces. So I'm now just going to take you through the family analysis on its own rather than the broader overview. So what we've done is we've used this framework and basically we have um, along the top is the family wellbeing domains and ideally those are your outcome domains. So that's why we've used the term domain there. Those are what you would be measuring at a family unit level where you're bringing all the different family information together. Unfortunately, we're unable to do that. Then we have the four core family functions which um, contribute to family well-being. They are identified as care, to care, nurture and support, manage resources, provide socialisation and guidance, and provide identity and sense of belonging. So those are the ones on the left hand side. On the right hand side here we have factors that hinder or help for families to effectively perform those core functions. And they include um, factors grouped under the theme here is of health, relationships and connections, economic security and housing, safety and environment, skills, learning and employment, identity and sense of belonging. Then along the bottom here we've got the contextual setting. And a key part of that contextual setting is family structure and transitions over time. And that's not just about relationships, it's about transitions through your career in terms of employment, in terms of health, those sorts of aspects. And right at the bottom, economic, social, cultural, environmental, political and demographic contextual settings through time. And I guess one of the things that we're very conscious of as we move further on with this work is the need to, to try and take some of those cohort and cultural effects um, into account better. So this is very much just a first initial mapping sort of aspect. So what we did is we took each of those six theme areas or factors and we um, mapped five indicators to each of those theme areas. And we created a graphic as well to bring it all together. So around the outside here are your six theme areas. So we've got economic security and housing, health, identity and sense of belonging, relationships and connections, safety environment, and skills, learning and employment. Then within that are each of the five indicators that we've chosen. Now, majority of these indicators are from the General Social Survey. Um, then we have a few, and that's where we've got these dotted lines, which are actually census-based data. Now the beauty of census-based data is that because you've got information from all the different members of the family, we can actually report based on families. It actually does provide you the data to give you a proper family, um, family level da uh, data which you can report from. Um, the, all of the other ones where you've got the solid lines, those are where the sample data sets, so that was General Social Survey, um, the HES, the Disability Survey, and for those, because we've only got the responses that are just from one individual and those are weighted up in terms of representing individuals in the population. 
we can actually only report about the percentage of, or proportion of individuals in those sorts of families. So for example, we can say 60% of two-parent families with younger children um, have adequate income, say, it's just an example. Um, we don't know whether that's 60% of different families or whether it's 60% of people and actually they only belong to, you know, there's, there's majority of families have two that are, two that have got, um, are who are unemployed or, or whatever. Okay, so within the inside of the circle, the longer the line is, basically, is the higher the percentage. And because all of these indicators are framed in the positive direction, what this shows is how the longer the lines, the better basically that family type is faring. So I started off with the one parent with at least one child under 18 years of age. And as you can see here, in the economic security and housing domain, there's much, much smaller, um, as you'll see when I put the other one up as well, but there's low proportions here. 20, about a quarter of them who have affordable housing, and that was based on his data um, in terms of uh, less than 25% of their disposable income. 31.6% living in less deprived neighbourhoods, and for those who know the NZ DEP, that was um, a 1 to 5, rating of 1 to 5 in that index. 60% uh, who were satisfied with their standing of living, and under half. 45 or 46% who had an adequate income, and that was based on 60% of the median um, equivalised income. Okay. Also over here we see that there are um, potentially as mental health concerns here, 44.2%. Now the physical mental health um, indicators are based on the SF12 from the uh, General <coughs> Social Survey and using the questions relating to mental and physical health. Interestingly, although the SF12 um, percentages differ quite a bit, almost all of the family types basically feel that they themselves are in good, good general health. So it's that sense of how they rate their own self-perceptions about how they're doing relative to their cohort, I think. Um, so I'm just, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to flick, because I'm conscious that we haven't got a lot of time, through the different family types and just point out some of the key aspects around the findings and also just a little bit about where the data sources were from. Okay, um, oh, just another point is that from the youth survey we've got data but it's only for uh, the parents where you've got a child under 18 years of age because that's a school based survey. So as of youth and the questions that we used for those were around family fun, how often do you have family fun and how often do you have family meals together and our indicator is for those who have at least three or more family meals together a week. Um, and then the other one was feel safe at home. So for these questions, they only relate to this family type and the other one I'm about to show you. The other area where we've got a missing gap is we chose to leave this missing was engage in family traditions. Although it looks like we've got lots of data here which reflects how families are faring, we've actually got some crucial areas which are missing and some of those relate very much to the idea of family relationships and family dynamics and also the way the questions are asked. It's how, how do you get on with your family rather than a rating of how do you think the different family members get on together. So they're quite, quite different things that come through. Now let me see if I can get this right this time. Right. So just, um, although it's not ideal, because actually what we're wanting to do over time is to monitor those changes. We've got about three years of data at the moment, but because of the sample sizes, once we start breaking under family types, it means that the estimates are, estimates mean that we can't actually, with confidence, say, yes, that change is real at this stage, so we've got to have another couple more data hits before we can start looking at the information in that kind of way. So what we've tended to do instead to give our sense that that benchmark or sense of, of, of how a family is faring is look across to some of the other family types. So two parents with at least one child under 18 years, you can see relative to the one parent families, the economic security and housing aspects, although I mean there's still 56.8% 50, who um, have got affording, uh, say they've got affordable housing, there's still you know, a significant minority who, who are paying um, costs, you know, high costs in terms of their housing. Um, 
but overall, you've got you know 87% who say who've got an adequate income. So they're in a much better position relative. You can see the difference there in the spokes that are coming out. But in terms of the do not smoke, that was one of the things because for the census data we can look at change over time because we've got that population of information. Um, that was one significant um, factor that dec was decreasing over time for all the different family types was um, the proportion who did not smoke. Though one parent families were the most prevalent smokers and about a third in those families smoked. So just quickly looking at the other family types, <coughs> couple both under 50 years of age. So the general finding for this group was that they, although they had also some difficulties, some shorter lines there in terms of economic security and housing, um, their health was, was generally good um, and they had strong education background and they were actually generally sort of quite well placed given if you think of them early on in their life course stage to actually develop and build up their assets over time. In terms of couple one or both 50 years of age and over, I think that's kind of starting to reflect more the other end of the spectrum in terms of life course. And you can see here that um, you've got a much higher percentage of those, um, well a lower percentage with no disability, so a higher proportion with disability, so four, four out of ten, only 39% only who are saying they had good health, mentally healthy, again not smoking. Um, but over here you can also see though, they, they tended to be fairly economically secure. Um, and they, their affordable housing costs was quite high, 85.3%. So they seemed fairly well placed. As, you, as I said before, these indicators here are missing because they were only relevant to the um, family types where there were younger children involved. And then a third sort of like category, if you like, of families was those with all children 18 years of age and over. Now these are going to be a bit of a mixed bag, especially for the one parent um, family type. In terms of the two parents with all children 18 years of, of age and over, we were thinking that that's probably about you know, kids staying on when they go to university, those sorts of aspects, especially with the two parents' space. Again, fairly um, positive in terms of the economic security and housing aspect. The health, uh, mental health was 50% of both with the median aspect. So there's nothing really that was hugely surprising here. In terms of the one parent with all children 18 years of age and over, this did have um, concerns. There was 40.5% who were living in less deprived areas, so majority, 60% were in the um, more deprived areas, if you like. Um, again, increase in terms of prevalence of long-term disabilities, and that was based on the disability survey, and long-term being six months um, or over, and affecting your ability to undertake day-to-day -day activities. Um, and again, and also in the physical health and mental health a bit lower there. Oh, interesting, this, this aspect here with the one parent with all children 18 years of age and over, when you look at the age demographic for that group, um, it actually there's, there's a peak around 45, around 50 age group, but then another peak around the 80, uh, 75 plus. So this will be a mixture of one parent families where you've actually got the child who's looking after an elderly parent, say, so you've got so you've got both kind of dynamics operating in that space. So that's just a really, really quick overview of the approach that we took and some of the findings. There's a wealth of data in this report. Um, and as well as this report, there's a um, online technical companion report which has every indicator in it with um, a presentation of a table with all the different response options. So if there were particular sort of responses that you wanted to look at which weren't the ones that we chose specifically for our indicators, you could actually have a look at that as well. Um, there are also um, at a glance, two at a glance publications and a research summary. And the at a glance really is just um, presents the wellbeing frameworks that were used and the other one looks at the demographic profile of the different family types that we um, were examining. Now I'm now going to pass you over to Andrew to talk about the final wellbeing analysis. Thank you. Kia ora huhu mai koutou, uh, no, 
Andrew Sport Takawinga no Nati Apa Rangatani me Te uh, which basically means that my forebears really didn't know where they wanted to live. Um, <coughs> and uh, for my for my sins, I'm uh, working at Auckland University. I'm uh, one of the few Māori statisticians that there are. Uh, although um, we do have some world leaders in, in our midst to keep a low profile. Um, Unfortunately, you have me today. This project was actually led by Tahu Kukatai. Um, Matt Roskids did most of the analysis, um, which meant sitting in summer in a cold, dark basement at Waikato University, where Tahu and I were out in the sun deciding what we were going to do with this work. What I want to talk to you about today is something actually really important. We haven't had a, a report of this scope since Rapa Water. Right? But the difference between this and Rapa Water is in fact now we're actually talking about official data. Rapper Water, we actually had to go out, or the league had to go out and collect their own data. Right? And now we have a national survey that is done by the Crown looking at Māori wellbeing. Um, and today I want to give you the fir very first steps of how productive that particular exercise is going to prove to be. I'm also the age where I now need two pairs of glasses, um, so I'm going to cope without. So, when we, um, we built this report around the Fano Rangatira framework that uh, came out of Tupuru <laughs> last year, and it was an attempt to conceptualise uh, Fano well-being in a way that we can actually start putting some measures in it. Now, lots of, ex uh, lots of work has been done um, with this in the last uh, 20 years or so, but this actually brings all of that together and a nice consolidative framework that is focused on whānau wellbeing. And the way that this was done was there was five wha uh, whānau wellbeing principles, uh, whakapapa or thriving partnerships, uh, manaki tanga <coughs> which is reciprocity and support, and you'll see how important that is uh, in the survey results. We have rangatira tanga with leadership and participation, kotahi tanga which is expressions of collective unity, and, um, and finally wairua tanga which is spiritual and cultural strength. And again, you'll see um, in the report uh, much more detail about, detail about how important that is for whānau wellbeing. Within each of those four um, principles, we'll put four dimensions. Now, those four dimensions mainly relate to uh, put a sort of measurability a a aspect to those, uh, those five principles. And those uh, four dimensions were sustainability of Te Ao Māori, making sure that we can actually keep our world going. Um, social capability, the ability of our, um, and skills available to our people, um, hu human resource uh, potential, the potential of our people, and economic well-being, which is a range of standard economic measures, but also how the, the economic is actually sh is shared amongst whānau. And we put all of that together and we produce a nice little table, and of course you're not going to be able to read much of that at all. But what you can see is we end up with 20 different cells with all these different measures, really, really, really comprehensive. And then we say, okay, what information do we have? What information do we have that can populate that to tell us how far um, Fano are doing? Well, actually, we're doing pretty well now, because with, um, now that we've got Tukupenga, we've got all but about three of the cells down here in the economic area. Something to work on in the future, but we actually now can get quite a comprehensive idea of whānau well-being just from uh, official data thanks to the advances of Kupinga and some additional data from the census. So what about Kupinga? Um, and here we have some people who are responsible for this amazing um, survey uh, <coughs> in this room. So um, all credit to them. But basically what we've got here is a nationally representative survey of Māori age 15 and over. Okay? This is a first. It's Māori by both ancestry and or ethnicity, because what we know about ethnic identity is, yeah, some people do and some people don't and some people change their mind, right? But everybody has whakapapa. Not everybody knows about it, but there's two different measures, so we thought we'd put, uh, that they wisely put them both in. And it was carried out by Stats New Zealand following the 2013 census. Now, it is a very, very high quality survey, right? 
by any, if by any metric in terms of official stats. These are results that any market research survey would be very, very proud of. Right? It has an excellent sampling frame in this 2013 census, and that means 2013 census had a very high coverage rate for Māori. We can actually tweak it a little bit and make it better, but it's, it's um, around 94, 95%. Um, and they selected a sample of Māori age for over 15 from that census, so a very good sampling frame and an, an amazing response rate. Right? I teach survey design, and that is impressive. Right? When we first, uh, when Te Kupinga was mooted, it was, that was perceived as one of the dangers that it may be we won't get such a good response rate, but the, uh, Stats New Zealand and the team did a remarkable job. There was 5,549 responses, um, and it, but we must remember that those responses are actually a sample of the population. So as a sample of the population, what, this, what sample surveys produce aren't actual counts, right? They don't say 439 <coughs> um, people in this area do this. They produce an estimate, and an estimate's got a little bit of an error, okay? And that error is related to the size of the survey, which is why it's really important that it's got a good survey size. So um, all credit to Stats New Zealand uh, Te Ata Fire team. Um, you've done an amazing job, and uh, we're only just beginning to discover how useful this, this survey tool's going to be. <coughs> So, what kind of whānau did they look at? Okay. Um, there's been books written about this stuff, okay? <laughs> and none of them agree, um, but, <laughs> well actually it's not quite true, but in terms of whānau, we've got the standard um, whakapapa whānau, kin-based whānau, <clears throat> but also um, incorporated in the survey is the idea of kōpapa whānau, whānau based on, on, on function, activity, or some other sense of collective. Um, and within the whakapapa whānau, we've got what, um, large or extended families are accounted for, but also the nuclear or immediate families that kind of translate to Stats New Zealand's standard um, long-held definition of, uh, of the family group. So, what kind of whānau types do we have? Exactly the same as the family types, so I won't go through the, all of them, but I will say we've got couples alone, based on age of the, of the couple, um, parents, based on the age of the children, right? Uh, and then one parent family, with again, based on the age of the children, and here we have multi whānau household. Now, Tahu, Matt and I decided that we really, really, really wanted that in there um, because that's important for us. We have a lot of whānau, um, multi whānau households, and to actually unbundle of, um, a multi whānau household into separate kind of family groups wasn't actually going to capture what's going on in that particular group that's very uh, important for us, especially in terms of multi-generational. Um, households. So I'm going to run you very quickly through each of the whānau types rather than present the whole complicated table um, or even try to put that up there because none of you will be able to read it because um, I certainly can't at this distance. Uh, then <coughs> I'm just going to give you four main points about each whānau type. The key thing that we noticed from this entire survey was the diversity of whānau wellbeing. Right? Mason and Co have long talked about the diverse Māori realities. This is uh, the, the book that you're about to receive is a really good uh, example of that. Diverse Māori realities, diverse Māori outcomes. Each different whānau type had its strengths and its weaknesses. There was no consistently strong whānau type. There was no consistently weak whānau type. Right. But some really key th themes emerge. First of all, let's have a look at the, um, those uh, couples with, um, who are both under 50 years of age but no children. Now this group are least, the least likely to engage with te ao Māori. Oh, better, first of all, sorry, they're about 8% of all um, whānau involved in, uh, in te kūpenga. So about 8%, not a large group. But they're the least likely to involve themselves in aspects of te ao Māori in terms of visiting marae and things. Um, <coughs> They have a very high de degree of autonomy in terms of um, they feel one of the questions in there relates to how do you feel about, uh, about the extent to which you have control over your own lives and they have one of the highest. They've almost 70% felt that they had a very high level of control over their own lives and destiny. They had very uh, well, relatively low ratings of whānau wellbeing which we thought was quite interesting. Um, 
given their age group, but um, with just over 40% report that their whānau were doing well. And again here, we've actually taken the, the well-being end of the scale, okay? So we're, we're actually measuring how many think their whānau are actually doing really well. That's actually a 10-point scale, and if we cut it into slices, it's like cutting a cake into slices, too many slices, you end up with really messy margins, okay? So it's better to have one group and, and this and, um, one large group, and the large group um, we've chosen is at the positive end. To give us an idea of how well our people are doing, rather than yet another report about the issues that we need to address, or need to be addressed by other people. So, <clears throat> but they were actually really well resourced. These were the rich fellows, relatively, okay? Um, probably because they don't have kids, he says, having two teenage kids of his own. Next whānau type. Um, Couple who are, uh, who are living by themselves, no kids, but 50 and older. Okay, um, I wish I was like this. I'm the, I'm a, I've got the age group, I just haven't got rid of the kids yet. Right, um, I've got my <laughs> they generally assess the quality of their whānau well-being very positively. Okay, um, <clears throat> probably because the kids have gone. Um, but, <laughs> they're, but they're less likely to exp um, experience social is isolation, which is actually really important, despite the fact that um, that they're living by themselves, they actually aren't feeling socially isolated at all, which is actually a surprise for us, because we thought, oh, it'll be the kids that'll actually provide the networking, which we do see in other family types. But then, um, <coughs> more than two thirds say that they never felt lonely in the last four weeks. Um, the they were the, f I had the highest rate of formal engagement with iwi and voter participation of any type. Again, we're, begin we're beginning to see um, in Kupenga, age-based um, and whanautype-based differences in civic participation, especially voting and, uh, and iwi registration. And they had a much higher level of home ownership than other whanau. This is, this is me, okay, this is the two parents with at least one um, uh, child aged um, 18 years and over. This is only about 7% of whanau, but it's still quite important because this is where our kids are, okay? And we need to have a picture of the social um, environment in, in which the next generation uh, is being developed. So 58% report that they have enough or more than enough income um, to meet everyday needs. Sounds good, but it's actually 42% in the other direction, folks. Um, bear that in mind. Um, it generally feel really positive about how their whānau are doing. But... Uh, <coughs> And the, and the quality of the relationships that they have. There's high levels of manakitanga. Now, we're beginning to see this amongst any whānau that has children. They, we appear to survive economic hardship by a lot of reciprocity, give and take. And these, um, this particular fa family type have high levels of manakitanga with other house households and external groups, including um, organisations such as schools, churches and sports clubs, and just under half own their own home. Now that's, the home ownership is going to become a big thing for, um, for Māori society as our population age and are looking to, for a comfortable retirement. Um, that's putting that in context, so I'll just skip ahead in my notes. Right, um, now two parents, families with children um, 18 years in age and over, basically, we've got here a very strong connection with Tu Daunga Waiwai. Um, and have, they have considerable support networks to draw on to meet a range of circumstances. And this means crisis um, support or everyday support. And here we're beginning to see pictures of reciprocity. The um, families actually working together to provide uh, support networks. They have um, favourable perceptions about how their whānau are doing, and 60% um, have enough or more than enough income to meet everyday needs. It still means 40% though. The <coughs> now we come to one parent um, with families, and there's one parent family with uh, at least one child under the age of 18. They have really, this is, this is what a good news, bad news story, okay? There's some bad news down the bottom here in terms of economic um, adequacy. They have this, the, this family t type have the, worst perception of their own um, economic position 
um, and economic sufficiency in, in terms of having enough to actually meet their everyday needs, let alone um, crisis needs. Um, <coughs> they also have the highest level of discrimination or reported levels of, of discrimination. But against those two negatives, right, that amongst the more active providers of manaki, tangata, marae, hapu and ibi in the form of unpaid help. Okay. So despite the fact that things might be going tough for them, they're also given to other people and other organisations, and they have a really, really, really strong identity as Māori. One of the strongest of any family type. Did that change? Yeah. yeah this, is, and this is a one-parent family with all children over, aged, over 18 and over. And more than half of those, um, and this is, um, sorry, just back onto this, in terms of the single parent family, that's 15% of whānau. Okay. Um, so it's not the large group that some areas of our media like to report, but it's still an important part of our society, very important part, especially with the upbringing of young children. One parent family with all children 18 years age or over is that Again, we begin to see, uh, we see strong senses of identity. In, in this case, uh, with a strong sense of attachment to a uh, Tūranga Waiwai. So, the first of all, they actually have to have a place that they identify with tu as a Tūranga Waiwai, and also as a strong sense of attachment to that place. They have similar levels of manakitanga as to other whānau. Again, despite the fact they're sing single parents, they're still contributing to other um, groups and other organisations. And they, but they report a, a moderate level of whānau well-being, but the lowest level of personal health. Okay, so the whānau's doing all right, but not so much them, personally. Now this group is the group that has the highest level of economic um, insecurity. Multi-family households uh, were, were actually quite an important group um, in terms of uh, Quite a different picture that we're beginning that we see. They have really, really strong connection, uh, cultural connections, high level of engagement with Tūranga Waiwai and Marae. That means not just identification with, but actually engagement with. Um, and it's probably because these are multi generational uh, uh, fa uh, whanau. They show manakitanga beyond their own households and contribute to groups beyond their own whanau. Again, despite the fact that we have high levels of economic security, these whānau are givers, okay? They're providers, they're contributors, um, and they're, they're making a difference to social networks beyond their own whānau. Um, but the perceived whānau wellbeing is relatively low, which is a, a, a concern, again, because they tend to be multi-generational uh, whānau. Move forward, right, okay. So that's a quick run through of the different uh, seven different phenotypes. Much more in the way of detail in the report. Um, and if you're having trouble sleeping, as Bev said, there's all those tables on the web. Okay, the work tree. Um, <coughs> so that's the that's what we've done so far with Takupi. But more is possible. Much, much more is possible. Um, what we could do, what we've done so far is just given a general description, a whānau orientated description using the information that's mainly come from Takupinga and a little bit from uh, the 2013 census. But we could actually give a much more detailed single point of time snatch, snapshot. There is much more that we could do, especially if we add a lot more census data, especially, uh, uh, you know, because the census data's got a lot more stuff about income. Um, the next step, though, is we can actually start doing some analytical work. So what kind of outcomes, you know, all kinds of things are associated with good outcomes. What kind of things are associated with bad outcomes? Um, <clears throat> and also we might t then turn that on the head saying, well, actually, we know here these are sort of key measures, especially measures that might be susceptible to kind of policy intervention, like housing. Okay, how's housing associated with good outcomes or bad out outcomes? We could do that within Takupinga in the census, and uh, hopefully that's on the agenda for next year. Um, and it, we could do that for each family type. Longer term, <coughs> if we do another Takupinga, right, we can actually start change, look at changing uh, changes across time. Okay, we've got an amazing snapshot. Okay, but you don't know about how things change unless you take another picture. Okay, it's like looking through the family album and just discovering how round and grey you've got. 
data. You actually need to have more than one snapshot. So um, we need to see that change across time, and there may be difference between regions, iwi, and age groups that are actually going to be really key. In fact, I can tell you there will be, right? Because we see a little bit of that in census data, but we won't get it. Uh, we can do some of that now from Tukupinga, but if we want a really good picture of that, when they do Tukupinga again, I'd like a larger sample, please. Okay? So th that means we can actually cut that cake up um, into more different slices. Now, um, <coughs> so that, that's a very quick run through of, of what's in the report. Um, all of the data that we use were um, pro provided by Stats New Zealand uh, under circumstances that were extremely um, good at protect protecting confidentiality, hence Matt having to sit in a dark room in the basement of Waikato University, um, and, uh, and, uh, and data security. So Stats New Zealand provided the data, but if any mistakes in there, I've already had one in the report, they're our fault, they're not Stats New Zealand's fault. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>